We're here tonight with Nelson Johnson from the Communist Workers Party. Nelson, I'd like to ask you uh, for the first question. Why do you think members of your organization were attacked on November 3, 1979? I think there are several reasons, at least three reasons, why members of the Communist Workers Party were assassinated on November 3, 1979. First, I think it was a very deliberate and conscious attempt to disrupt and discredit the work that was being done by members of our party in the factories in North Carolina, in the communities in North Carolina, and throughout the country. Uh, the work was very quality work. Um, organizers, union organizers, uh, had done a tremendous job in dealing with practical problems and propagating a broader understanding of the source of those problems. Uh, <coughs> So I think that there was a very real interest in stopping that kind of political trend from developing represented by our party, and in fact, uh, a very conscious effort to destroy the Communist Workers' Party. That, in my opinion, would be um, the first reason, to destroy the CWP. Secondly, and very related, it was to create uh, an atmosphere of confusion and fear with regards to uh, the working class, oppressed people, and to inject the notion that if you resist this backward trend represented by the Klan and the Nazis, you couldn't succeed, that you would be punished for it. Uh, and for those people who were clear on it, um, uh, it was just an intimidating act. And for many people, it was a confusing act because what had to happen uh, was that they were able to project or attempted to project a very distorted view of what communists were, what they were all about, uh, and cover up the real work that was going on. I think a third reason, and to some extent a byproduct of the first two, was to uh, promote or push forward uh, the trend represented by the Klan and Nazis. We have to remember that in 1979, um, there was a wave um, of activity by Klan-type groups, by right-wing groups. Uh, and I think we have to see that within the context of the economic situation as it was developing in 1979. Uh, we were seeing the beginning uh, of uh, the destabilization of capitalism, the, the depth of this particular crisis that most of us now have come to know and feel, and it's become a part of our daily lives. I think it was in that context that um, an attempt to confuse the American people, to destroy leadership that identified the problem and organized people in a very realistic and practical way, and put forth the view that the ultimate solution in terms of uh, a decent life for the people of this country would come as a result of changing the whole system as a result of revolution. So I think those are some of the reasons why the attack came down in November of 1979. Um, well, there was a lot of attempt to blame the people who were actually demonstrating against the Klan after the deaths. Um, could you tell us some of the forms that that took and why you think that happened? Well, I mentioned that there was a lot of confusion. And whenever uh, an assassination occurred, and I want to be clear, that our view is that it was a political assassination, carried on with the understanding uh, and active participation of elements of the government. Uh, when that occurs, you have to give some other explanation for why it occurred than the truth. In this case, uh, it was necessary to paint a certain image of the victims uh, in order, one, to get people away from looking at the actual work that they were doing. Uh, a view had to be developed that they bordered on uh, insanity, that they were lunatics of some kind, uh, that they were terrorists in the sense that terrorism has been defined uh, to the American people by the government here. I think all of that was necessary in order to prevent the American people from really looking at who were these people uh, and to justify what uh, the government uh, argued that the Klan and Nazis did by themselves. Um, and finally, to certainly obscure the truth of the relationship between Klan, Nazis, federal uh, government agencies. 
So I think all of these things were necessary uh, in order to cover it up. Um, just let me, I think a couple of the things that happened, um, some of very, very distorted and vicious information was put out. For example, uh, a headline story came out in the Greensboro Daily News saying that Jim Waller, a very respected organizer, president of his union uh, down at Granite Mill, Cone Mills in uh, North Carolina, that he uh, wanted to get himself killed that he planned to get himself killed on that day in order to become a martyr. Uh, other stories were written indicating that we uh, had children out there for the purpose of getting the children killed so that there would be greater sympathy. These are the kinds of things that were put out that made it easier for the American people to believe that, uh, the, that the CWP uh, was to blame for this and therefore the Klan and Nazis, people weren't able to look as seriously in that direction if they were obsessed with looking at these kinds of stories that were being actively propagated uh, through the news media and primarily by the federal government. Well, what kind of role did the media play in the, uh, in the coverage of the story? Were they able to get at the truth at all? I think the, the media played a very sorry role uh, and that has improved some. Uh, some credit is due to the media. Uh, a lot more is due to the fact that the truth was just laid in their laps over and over again and could not continually be uh, refused. Earlier on, uh, well, the very first day after the assassination, the Greensboro paper at least carried a story saying that it was an ambush, which was what people on the scene saw. Uh, it was what they reported. One day later, um, the whole story had changed and the phrase that got used over and over again was called a shootout. The New York Times carried an article uh, which essentially said that the CWP uh, uh, provoked the Klan and Nazis to come into the Afro-American community and then fired on them and the Klan and Nazis merely returned fire to defend themselves and that was the argument in the trial that occurred and frankly the basis of the acquittal that occurred. All of these stories were propagated uh, through the news media and I think that clarity on these points um, was available to the media. Uh, it was not that the confusion was so uh, profound, so thick that they weren't able to get clarity on it. It's simple that information got planted, it got repeated, and it got carried to the extent that the media carried the story at all. There was another trend um, several weeks after the assassination to downplay it in the media altogether. Mm -hmm. Well, what other, um, what other activities on the part of the government did, ha have led to the charges that your organization has made that there has been a cover-up of the facts surrounding the Greensboro case? Well, many, many facts have now been revealed to the people of this country. Uh, that were not known on November 3rd, 1979, and that the government has done a lot to uh, prevent the people from knowing. For example, we had absolutely no knowledge uh, that a federal agent with the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms Department uh, worked actively with the Klan and Nazis, um, did a tremendous amount of work in training them, uh, met with them two days before the assassination occurred. Um, and encouraged them to bring weapons. Uh, we had no knowledge that the FBI had carried out an investigation of the Communist Workers Party, which they blatantly denied, and we subsequently secured documents, uh, documents from the FBI, by the way, indicating that such an investigation was carried out. Um, uh, FBI agent uh, Thomas Barrington uh, actually erased portions of tapes uh, from uh, Jerry Paul Smith, who's a Klan's person being tried for murder. Uh, and there are a number of examples of that nature which indicate uh, and show fairly clearly government involvement. Um, we have um, people who were prepared to come before the grand jury to testify that they call the FBI 
the day before the assassination occurred to tell them, one, that the Nazis were planning to assassinate people on November 3rd, that they were securing weapons out of Ohio, and that they had a training camp in North Carolina. Um, I made an all-out attempt to present an affidavit to that effect uh, from the person who indicated that he wanted to come before the grand jury that had been forced into session to investigate uh, the uh, murders of November 3rd as a result of their acquittal. Um, and uh, the Justice Department uh, blocked that. We were not able to get to uh, members of the grand jury. I wrote uh, the U.S. attorney and eventually physically went to the place where the grand jury was meeting uh, and sought permission to give the information to them, only to have it seized by the Justice Department. And they have subsequently raised that they are going to consider charges for attempting to try to illegally influence the grand jury, as, as they assert. So one instance after another, uh, we've gotten all kinds of blocks from the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um. Do you, do you have any other examples of that you want to raise, or do you want to go on to the next question? When are we going? I'll come back to okay. it. Okay. Um, could you talk some about the um, the sort of political offensive that the that the CWP went on in order to force the government's hand in um, revealing some of the some of their involvement in November third? The political initiative. The political initiative that was taken by the CWP immediately after the assassination, first of all, was absolutely necessary. Without it, the view propagated by the state through the news media that the victims planned this uh, in order to secure some kind of distorted publicity would have prevailed or would have at least had more credibility than it eventually has gained. Um, <coughs> We, first of all, refused to be intimidated by the Klan, the Nazis, or the United States government. And the very day after the assassination, we publicly stated that we were going to have a funeral march um, a week later. And um, the city of Greensboro, with the active participation of members of the community uh, relations department of the Justice Department, said that there would be no such funeral march in the city of Greensboro. We insisted that there would be. Now, this is a very important point because uh, at that point, they were attempting to get us to retreat politically and to begin to say that we couldn't do things and that we shouldn't do things and we should bury our head in shame. And uh, we rejected that totally. And uh, the city was forced to retreat. We had the funeral march, even though there were a thousand National Guard call in. A uh, state of emergency was declared. Uh, tremendous intimidation uh, of the community, uh, scare tactics. Uh, the mayor, for example, going on television telling people that they would be um, in danger if they came to the funeral march. In spite of all of that, uh, we went forward. Several months later, we worked actively with a number of organizations, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, the Interreligious um, uh, Foundation for Community Development, and a number of other individuals and organizations around the country to pull together a broad front, united front of people, uh, to have a demonstration in Greensboro on February 2nd. Um, that was very important because one of the arguments the state was attempting to push was that it was impossible for anyone to work with the CWP, that these people were crazy, you couldn't work with them, and they were very, very frightening people to be around. We were able to break through that, uh, and it was not easy. There was all kind of provocation um, aimed at people who were working with us. People were actually told that uh, they were being set up to be killed by us. Uh, Members of SCLC was told this, and we know this for a fact. And we had to bend over backwards <laughs> to work with all of the people who genuinely wanted to see something done, but were themselves becoming a bit confused. Um, <clears throat> the court, uh, the so-called case of 1980, 
where six Klan and Nazis were brought to trial, uh, we assessed fairly early on that this all-out attempt to blame the victims would ride right through the court and that the process that we were beginning to witness uh, in 1980, the court process, would in fact be used as an attempt to really distort the reality of what had happened, uh, hope to put members of the Communist Workers' Party on the stand and badger them with abstract discussions about evil images of communism as conceived in the minds of uh, the propagandists here, bourgeois propagandists. Uh, and we decided that it would not serve the purpose of justice. It certainly would not serve the purpose of truth for us to participate in that kind of charade. And we publicly stated that. There were many people who didn't understand that at that time. Uh, and we denounced the whole trial. Uh, in fact, uh, we refused to testify. We refused to participate. Some people have raised questions about that, but there was absolutely no information that we had. Television cameras were there, witnesses were there, that was not available to the state. The state wanted members of our party simply to put the CWP on trial under the cover of trying the Klan and Nazis and to promote this view of left-right extremists, and we simply would not participate in that. Instead, uh, we launched a campaign to expose all of this uh, by um, politically attacking uh, uh, public officials. Uh, Carter was president of the United States at that time, sent in 22 FBI agents in the name of getting information uh, after the assassinations occurred. And what they did was to really badger and harass us. Personally, I endured a tremendous amount of um, badgering by the FBI physical threats to rip the bandages off of my arms as a result of the wound in the course of interrogation. These things actually happened. So we were very clear that they weren't sent there to get the information. And so we would raise this at political meetings where Carter was running against Reagan for president. And we did similar things with Kennedy and the others. Again, many people didn't appreciate that, but we think that it was a very significant way to politically lift up to the American people what was happening, at least a portion of that. And we took that into the Democratic Convention. So I think uh, from that time all the way up to now, we've become much more involved in some legal initiatives, which only became possible as a result of the political offensive, that the government was literally forced after the acquittal, after we said that the Klan and Nazi trial by the state of North Carolina was not really a trial seeking the truth, but seeking to cover up, that it was a sham, uh, and we exposed it as such, when in fact all of the Klan and Nazis were acquitted against such overwhelming and obvious evidence. Uh, and the fact that we had propagated that to the American people left the federal government in the position of attempting to cover themselves by convening a grand jury, and we called for that. Uh, and and it, took, it took them two years to do it, though, to two and a half years. Two to years do to it. do it and approximately 14 months in session, the grand jury process, which, by the way, is the longest that has ever occurred in the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So the political initiative uh, was necessary then, it's necessary now, and in fact it is a lesson that ought to be um, more broadly uh, propagated and appreciated by the American people. And that is when you're under attack that you can't um, submit to the pressures that argue that you ought not to, to boldly step forward and proclaim the truth in the arenas that are available to you to do that. Uh, and when you do that, it strikes a chord with people who have some sense of the injustice, but just don't have enough to work with. We have to provide that to them. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think is different now? I don't want to run out of time and tape. How far are we in? Mm -hmm. We got 10 more minutes? I would say eight or nine. Okay, okay. I'll cut you off. Okay, I'd rather, I'd rather go into the, um, uh, I was going to ask you more about the grand jury, but I can ask Lewis that. I'd rather go more into the, uh, what, what do you, where do you think Greensboro fits on the overall national 
uh, political scene in terms of its significance, both then and now? The rise of repressive groups. Well, I think that the assassinations in Greensboro marked, or at least accented, uh, an emerging phase of struggle in this country in which um, the move toward the right by uh, those who run the country, the rulers of the country, um, was heightened. Okay? On the other hand, it also marked a period in which the, the resistance uh, was also heightened. Uh, frankly, I think as a result of the assassination in Greensboro and the subsequent struggle waged uh, by the CWP and by many, many other organizations and people who join in it at various points in time, um, that as a result of that, that the trend, at least in its blatant form of Klan and Nazis coming out and shooting and intimidating organizers was temporarily held in retreat. That I think the years of 1980 and 81, that that trend would have been much, much stronger had we not waged the political offensive and connected the government very, very clearly its interest uh, to this trend and promotion, promoting it through the Klan and Nazis. Um, I think, however, in 1983, um, that uh, as a result of the deteriorating situation that the country is in, economically, internationally, Central America, Africa, Asia, all over the world, uh, that its desperation lunges out even more, and we see that most sharply in Latin America. Uh, and we see uh, repre repressive apparatus being brought into being, such as the expansion of the FBI guidelines, the so-called Smith guidelines, uh, which uh, are obviously designed or aimed at the American people, aimed at political organizers, um, and there are some very frightening clauses in there. Um, essentially, uh, it gets down to uh, the right of the FBI to spy on anybody that they think uh, has any relationship to anyone else who might be considering what they define as terrorism. This thing is so elastic as to have no end to it, basically. Uh, and I think that um, I went to Washington to the hearings by Orrin Hatch and to uh, the congressional hearing, and we publicly raised opposition to it. Uh, and we raised it in the name of Greensboro, that it was this same government, which we have now documented evidence to show uh, that it orchestrated the murder of political organizers in Greensboro, is asking for an expansion of its power, and we were arguing to do more of the same thing. Uh, it was not at all related uh, to um, fighting terrorism uh, as they defined it. So I think in 19, I think the significance of Greensboro is that uh, because uh, the state and the federal government has been so tightly connected to it, that we're able to expose um, the trend towards setting up repressive political apparatus by showing what happened there and how they used that. That's the significance of it. If that battle had not been fought, if we had um, been crushed, uh, had not resisted, then we would not have been able to propagate those lessons today. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen in the future with the, with the Greensboro case? What, what are your expectations for it? Well, I th there's going to be a trial, a federal trial, of um, nine Klan and Nazis. Um, I expect some to be convicted. Um, I expect uh, that the government will do all that it can in the course of that trial to resurrect the view that uh, this was gang warfare, extreme right and extreme left, has very little to do with the realities of life in America. It's an aberration. Uh, I expect uh, us to be called, and we expect to testify. We expect to be badgered. But we think that uh, the situation in 1983 is very different from 1980. 
and that much of what was not known in 1980 is known now. Uh, so the latitude of the government to badger us uh, and to use the trial uh, as political propaganda uh, is not nearly as strong, and therefore we are inclined to participate in it, but with our eyes very wide open. There are, there's also going to be uh, a federal civil rights trial. Uh, we expect that to occur. There are tremendous difficulties with it that I'm not acquainted that much with the details. Uh, but we're suing federal, state, uh, local governmental officials, as well as Klan and Nazis, for $48 million. Uh, that process will have to unfold through court. And in addition, we are asking for indictments ourselves of specific FBI agents on whom we have accumulated necessary information to show that they perjured themselves, that they actively blocked investigation. One in particular is Thomas Barrington, who is the... Um, who was out of Greensboro, North Carolina, and played a major role in the grand jury process, as well as in the 1980 trial. Uh, we in fully intend to fight for those indictments. Uh, well, how likely do you think it is that the, that the, um, the full role of, of the government will ever be revealed? Well, it's important for us to reveal as much as we can. To some extent, it's secondary as to whether we reveal all of the details of government on this particular case. Uh, it is going to be revealed in relationship to a whole panorama of activities uh, that the government is involved in. So without predicting whether or not all of the information will come out, I think that's possible. Uh, I think on the other hand, it's very possible that much of it will not come out. Uh, but we think that the government is going to be exposed increasingly on a number of other activities, from toxic waste uh, to war making in Central America, uh, and that we want to draw the relationship between what happened in Greensboro and all of those things, such as to give an integral picture of what our situation is in this country and why uh, the American people will have to make revolution in order to have some measure of decency, uh, economic stability, and security in their life. Is that it? Is the tape gone? Okay. Is there, is there anything? I think there are two things that people can do to assist the effort in Greensboro, which is connected to all of the efforts. One is the trial will be coming up probably in October of Klan and Nazis. It's very important for people to stay abreast of what happened and to tune in to that trial. There will be some media flashes of it, but the Greensboro Justice Fund uh, will be carrying out a campaign to invite people into Greensboro to watch the trial. Number two, uh, a number of citizens in North Carolina pulling together what's called a great movement for unity and justice, probably including a march from Greensboro to Winston-Salem to highlight the fact that the trial is minuscule in relationship to all of what has happened and what is really on trial. The federal agents are not on trial. 